Good morning. Let me start with a quote to wake you all up. Um, what a mystery, what a strange heavy weight of mystery that could lie soft and heavy in one's hand. The roots, root of all that is lovely, the primeval root of awful beauty. That's um, D.H. Lawrence talking about testicles. And I thought that would really wake you all up. <laughs> and now you're all with us and we can start this panel. Um, <laughs> I'm Theodora Danek. I'm the um, translation manager at English Pen. Thank you all for coming and thank you for my wonderful panelists and all of you for making it out at 10 on the Thursday of Book Fair. Really appreciate it. Um, we're here today to talk about sex and literature and how sex travels in translation. Um, we seem to have lost one of our panelists probably due to the early hour, but um, I'm going to introduce who we have here next to me. We've got next to me Tess Lewis. Tess Lewis is a translator from German and French, a really fantastic translator um, and award-winning. Um, we're here to talk with her a bit about um, one of the books that is on the BTBA um, long list at the, mo at the moment, which is Incest by Christine Angon and some of her other, the other books that Tess has translated. We also have Nikki Smalley. Um, you may know Nikki either as um, a translator from Swedish and Norwegian, or you may know her in her day job as the publicity and all round amazing person and, at And Other Stories. Um, one of the books that we may discuss that And Other Stories have published is um, Brett Easton Ellis and the Other Dogs by um, Swedish author Lena Wolf. Um, your next translation out is Jor Steingarder's new novel. If you were a teenage girl like me and you loved Sophie's World, you will probably look forward to what Nikki is going to put into your hands very soon. Right, okay, um, I think we're going to dive in. Um, I thought we could start with, um, with this novel, Incest, and really dive in at the deep end and discuss um, what it was like um, translating this novel and what issues we can tackle, uh, we have to tackle when um, sex travels from one country to another. Um, we, I think we would also like to talk today about um, cultural differences that may come up when translating a novel, who gets to write about sex, the status of sex in literature, especially now after the Me Too movement, and um, any other issues that are related to that. Tess, do you want to give us a brief overview of um, incest and all the issues that came up when translating it? It was, it was extremely difficult to translate, not just because the subject matter is disturbing and distasteful. It is a novel. She says it's a novel, but it is based almost, I mean, just very exactly on her own life and her own experience, as are all the books she writes. And in fact, she told an interviewer once that she doesn't really see any difference between all her narrators who are all called Christine Angu. They're just different parts of her personality that come through. So, so there's the, the disturbing subject matter, um, in particular, not just the experience she had at the hands of her father, but also the way she talks about her relationships to others, particularly her daughter. She, which One thing she's trying to do in this book that is more than just read, uh, write about um, the experience of incest is to give the reader a sense of what it's like to go through the world with the emotional baggage that comes from living through an experience like this. And she really does do that very well. It's a very claustrophobic narrative. Um, the problem of writing about, I mean, writing, translating Explicit passages is always difficult because the terminology is freighted so differently in the different languages. And on top of that, she plays word games. So she will talk about her erratic punctuation, which she sees both as an emotional um, legacy or an emotional distortion from her experience, but it's also a projection. So she'll talk about how the comma in French, virgule, comes etymologically from the same root as verge, which is penis. And so you get commas and little penises creeping, uh, appearing in the text, which it makes sense in French. But you have to sort of massage the word plays into some kind of coherent English um, punning text, but not too much, and try and catch the emotional distortions as well as the linguistic distortions. So that, 
I think, captures many of the challenges, although there, there were more. Um, I think when we talked before, you mentioned that there were real emotional challenges to translating a book that is um, quite emotionally intense as well. I wonder if you could talk about how, as a translator, you tackle those things. Um, I, I just had to pace myself. Uh, usually I can translate for hours at a time, three or four hours, but you know, an hour with Christine Ongo is, is sometimes more than enough for a day. So it, it did take me longer, not just because it's a challenging text uh, linguistically, but emotionally it's draining. Mm. So I would just have to, I would take breaks, sometimes a day, sometimes a week, and then come back to it. Um, I would take a break by reading similar books, um, say Catherine Harrison's, Harrison's The Kiss, um, which is also a, a incest, well, it's an incest memoir, but it's much more reserved. Mm. So it sort of gave me another angle of how people wrestle with that experience. Mm. And then I'd dive back into to, to Christine Ongo. I mean, so obviously incest is a, um, is a very specific book and it's not representative of books that have sexually explicit passages at all. So Nikki, I wonder if you could just tell us about your experience about translating sexually explicit material. Um, so my... <coughs> Yeah, you need to go closer. <coughs> Sorry. So my main experience of translating sex is translating short stories that feature, um, you know, often often sexual experiences uh, among like between young people or um, sexual experiences kind of unexpected sexual experiences and things like that and I um, I'm just thinking about one particular um, case where uh, I, I translated a short story by a Swedish writer and um, she and I translated this story and it was it was quite it was quite graphic but I felt like as I was translating it I was struggling to find language to use that was not there was graphic but not pornographic because it felt like the Swedish wasn't doing something pornographic necessarily it was erotic but I mean I, to be honest I don't actually think that there's necessarily has to be a difference between erotic and pornographic and I think I'm I don't want I don't want to sound prudish about it but it just felt like the tone of the short story was very literary and it felt like I had to use language that was not dominated by cliché. And I think this is one of the main challenges of translating or writing sex, in fact, is that so much of sex, the way we talk about sex, is kind of coded in like really, really specific clichés. Um, and there are very few there are very few alternatives to those cliched words, you know, if you... And, and often if you try and steer away from the cliched words, it starts to sound like euphemism. And you don't want to... If you're writing something that's graphic, you don't want to sound euphemistic because that's, you know, completely missing the point. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to necessarily be using the same words that everybody else does, especially in a literary text, which is meant to be creative and is meant to feel special in some way. So, um, I think, I think um, the story that I'm thinking about was actually about a woman having an affair, and, um, and it was just very straightforward and honest and frank, and as I say, graphic. And I thought that I'd done a translation that kind of matched that. And I met her then, later, at, a, um, um, at the Gothenburg Book Fair, where we did a joint reading. She read in Swedish and I read in English. And it was really interesting because afterwards we were talking, you know, we had a, like, a little chat about it like in front, of an, in, in front of an audience. And she was saying that it was really interesting to her to read my English because she was so used to reading American styles of porn or erotica 
that use the kind of cliched language that I'm talking about. And I suddenly realized, was it, was it cliched language that I was thinking? Or was it just Americanisms that I was trying to avoid because I'm British? And, and, and it was really interesting because she read it as sounding very polite. And I was like, ah, that's really funny because I don't feel like a polite person. I'm not a prude. You know, I'm very like, frank and open about sexuality in my own life. Um, but her, her reading of it, you know, because she had these kind of, the words that you use to describe sex, for her were American English words. I just, I, I thought that's a really interesting, you know, I mean, that's not necessarily about differences in cultural reception depending on the, the source and target language, but that's something about the differences within a, a given language. You know, or different variants of, of a given language. Mm. And it, I didn't really know what to say, you know, because I was like, well, I didn't mean it to sound polite, but obviously, <laughs> like, for people who are used to American English, you know, because most people who learn English around the world who are not native English speakers learn a variant of, of American English. And so their kind of... their way of framing English is in that... Mm. American style. I just, yeah, it was something that I just was really surprised by. Well, I had an interesting experience um, translating not this book, but a, a Swiss writer, Lucas Barefuss, um, who wrote a novel about a Swiss aid development worker who was stuck in Rwanda, and he becomes obsessed with a with a Hutu woman who then turns into a, the leader of one of these militant uh, massacring gangs. But. Um, he, as he becomes more obsessed with this woman, his language gets more and more graphic and his, the character's inner misogyny comes out. And it's, it was interesting to then go the back and forth with my copy editor in which the author also took part because there are different cultural weights and valences to the various terms. I mean, politeness, but also you know, moral judgment. I mean, one typical example is um, the German word for pubic hair is shamha, so the shame is right there embedded in, in the term, and they don't really have another term, and to find an English or an American equivalent is, is really tricky. That doesn't bring in a, put it in a completely different context, either, you know, distanced or with moral judgment or technical, so it's, um, it's not it's just reception, it's encoded in the language. But it's interesting that you say that, because... Um, I speak German and um, I grew up speaking German and I genuinely never thought before this moment that Shamha has anything to do with shame. So um, there are things that maybe you're not aware of in your own language then, that then obviously translators are much more aware of, which is the interesting thing about your profession. But I think you also said that you had to navigate um, with Lucas Berfus and the copy editor how to... Um, how to, the, like the right word for a man's penis because um, there are so many different variants. And he also, his use of, or the way he talked about the narrator's member changed with his increasing obsession, but then the author speaks English relatively well, but not quite well enough. So he was insistent that the word prick had to be used, but prick has too many, um, in the context in which that particular word was being used more than once in the novel, it would have been too easy for the reader to assume it was an insult rather than a descriptive term. So then it came down to, you know, various other words, whether it was dick or cock or schlong or, you know, um, and in fact, the, the book that won the Bad Sex Writing Award last year was translated from Italian and it has a passage with various uses, um, descriptions of, of the, the member and it was particularly, I think it, it won, there were two actually translations of this book and it won on the strength of a description of, um, of, of the member. If you look up Urban Dictionary or uh, synonyms various things online. It, there's a surprising number, but many of them are, are, are attempts at being witty. Um, they're really not usable. And the, um, at one point, the Swiss author used my little friend. 
or his little friend, the narrator's little friend. I, we found an alternative for it, but it wasn't easy because it's, it was this constant navigation between perceived overtones and, and intentional overtones put there by the author. And his, his particular, he probably learned those terms through American, you know, pornographic works as well. Um, Ellie is here. Hello. <laughs> so um, this is Ellie Goldstone. Ellie is a, a really amazing um, author, um, recently of Strange Hearts Beating, which came out with Granta. Um, and she also has a sex column in Some Such Stories. Um, and Ellie, we can dive right in because we talked about um, translation, but now we can ask you, an author, how do you write about sex? <laughs> wow, we're just going straight in. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Into this. Okay. Um, you do it, I think... Well, the joke answer to that is very carefully, um, but actually I think the opposite of that is probably the best way to do it. Um, I think people are probably too careful with the way they write about sex, um, and it shows. Um, I can, whenever I read about sex that's been written very carefully, I think um, I can feel um, the stress of the author um, attempting to be insouciant about something that... Um, actually is being picked up on for bad sex awards and etc um, and so I think a lot of people try and avoid it for that reason um, it's yeah it's difficult because as soon as you start it's I mean it's just like having sex as soon as you start thinking about it too much it ruins it um, so I try and think about it as little as possible and write about it in the same way that I write about everything without the spectre of the bad sex awards over my shoulder. I love the passage. There's a passage in your novel where um, your um, where you write. Um, she lies on top of her shoes, using the shoes for a pillow, and they give her head or whatever the hell the term is for doing it to a woman. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like you're um, limited by the language you have available? Um, I think that writing the character of Seb I it was quite difficult to write someone who was essentially quite sexually uh, awkward and I <laughs> yeah it's quite difficult to write about sex um, through the voice of someone who would never talk about sex mm. um, so that was interesting for me I do think that we are limited by language um, I think that the English language and um, all the metaphors that we use for sex, it kind of ruins it. Um, yeah, so I do, I do think that language um, does hamper us a little bit. How do you guys feel about that from a translator's perspective? Language as a limit or as an opportunity, especially compared to the languages that you translate from? It's both, an, an, uh, well for me, it's both a limitation and an opportunity, but it's, it's so much easier. Being a translator, we, we have something to work with. We never look at the blank page. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's more a massaging of what's there rather than trying to, to construct something. So we can think about it too much or not enough. It won't really matter because right. it's already there. Mm -hmm. But yes, so w I mean, for example, when the term shamhar comes up, I mean, you can search around in the English language and you know there's pudendum which of course etymologically is also linked to shame so you can you can find close alternatives or not too bad alternatives most of the time not always I think I mean I think this this is in a way what I was trying to refer to before about the thing the thing about sex writing about sex being you know steering a course between between cliche and euphemism, or maybe those two things are the same, but you know, the, um, and it's interesting actually, just thinking about how Swedish works as a language, they, um, just thinking, I've thought a lot about swear words, um, and in Swedish, they have, they have a lot of religious swear words, and relatively few bodily swear words. Well, they have lots of bodily swear words, but they're very, very mild. So, 
There are certain words like the, <clears throat> the equivalent of a word like cunt or something which are very, very strong. But generally, words for kind of bodily functions, you know, a five-year-old will say them and there's no way they'd be to told off. Whereas if a five-year-old said shit, you know, their parents might say, oh, that's not, you know, that's not a nice thing to say, dear, or whatever. Um, and, and I wonder if that means that... Maybe not on a sexual level, but on a, a physical level, there's more... You know, there's less of buttoned-upness about talking about the body and how the body works, which I think has, you know, natural sort of... Uh, spills naturally out into, into the way that you talk about sex. Um, I mean, I don't know. I would really love to actually... I would really love to read more writing about sex and I keep meaning to just like spend a few weeks like you know having like blitzing my my reading with like erotica and porn just because just to see what what works because I think as a translator I mean I you know like as a translator and as a publisher I read very or I try to read as widely as possible because that's how you know what's available or you know, what's out there that's how you know what you know, the different ways that you can express yourself. But I've never really taken the time to do that with... I mean, you know, since I read, like, A Nice Nin when I was, when I was 16 or whatever, you know, I've, I've never, never spent that much time reading erotica. And I think that that's... I think that's a hindrance. Like, I think that... Microphone. I think... Sorry. <laughs> keep forgetting about this microphone being so quiet. Um... I think it really, you know, only by reading can you find out what works in writing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you. I don't know if you would agree as a as a writer whether it's something that you've spent a lot of time doing. Um, I think. Well, talking about Anise Nin. I, that was really my first introduction into writing about sex, but obviously I, I didn't realise that it was so unusual at the time because I was a young teenager. Yeah. But I knew that I had to hide it under my bed. Um, it's yeah, it was yeah the most highbrow, um, sort of rebellious teenage <laughs> phase that anyone's ever had. <laughs> um, I also had vis annuals under my bed. It wasn't all. Um, but I do remember being sort of obsessed with the sex writing because I just found it so other. Um, because it's, like I said, people ch tend to avoid writing about sex because there are so many pitfalls. So you really do have to look for it. You really do have to focus and um, take the time and say, okay, I'm gonna read um, what I suppose is classified as erotica. Because, um, yeah, because as soon as something gets too sexy, then it's classified as erotica and it's not taken seriously as literature anymore, um, which I think is a dreadful shame um, because I don't think that the two categories should be, um, should be separated so resolutely, but they are. Um, I mean, romance fiction is the, the, by far the most best-selling type of fiction, but who's buying that fiction? Well, it's women, and so the fact that women are taking pleasure, great swathes of women are taking pleasure in it, means that it's not taken seriously. Um, that it's, it's described as romance fiction and it's frivolous and people, people, don't, with, people with taste don't read it. And, and I think that's sort of bizarre uh, in this day and age. We're supposed to be liberal and we're supposed to be um, discussing sex um, in the world and we're not supposed to be buttoned up anymore, but of course we very much still are. Um, Tess, I wonder if you could give us a French perspective on that, because um, I think France has a, a different attitude towards women, especially women writing about sex, and not just Christine Angon, but um, others as well. Well, there was, when, when um, Incest was published, it sold something like 100,000 copies in the first uh, six months. I mean, it really, and part of that is because she writes about herself and people. It's, she's constantly being sued for libel. So some of the frisson actually comes from what she says about her, you know, people she knows. And 
Um, there is a passage in the book where she quotes the lawyer's report to her publisher about what is libelous and what is not, whether she should change the names. And so she changes the names and she says, well, okay, then I'll call Catherine de Neuve Catherine de Cour. So she, you know, she plays with it and she's basically saying, I dare you to sue me for libel. Um, a couple, I think about five or ten years ago, she was sued by her current boyfriend's ex-wife because she was describing all sorts of intimate details about this woman's body and, and life. And um, I mean, it really is an invasion of privacy. And that's one of the things that made me so uncomfortable about this book. But the French seem to have a higher tolerance and a, and a deeper interest in books. I mean, there was a whole movement with Catherine Millet talking about her sex life um, or, you know, participating in orgies with her husband and all these things with, without much physical, uh, phys fictional gloss either. And French readers really did turn out and they bought the book. And on the one hand, I think it is a different approach um, or tolerance to explicit sexual writing. On the other hand, it's a much more closed community and you had to be able to talk about it and you had your judgments about, you know, Catherine Millet and um, the publishing world that she suddenly opened up to scrutiny. Uh, but there, there was also this, um, this sort of flood of books of women writing about their own sexual lives, which I haven't seen in any other country. And the German, uh, Germans in my experience, are quite open about their sexual lives, but not really in print, or not so much in print. Mm. Yeah, the only two I can think of is Elfriede Jelinek, and she doesn't write aut autobiographically, but she did um, plays about sex in the early 90s already. And then um, and there's Maxim Biller has written yeah. um, various things and gotten in trouble with libel, and also he wrote a book about uh, called The Daughter, and it's also an incest novel, but it... It hasn't been translated, I think, into any language because it is um, distasteful, mm. frankly. Yeah, there was also Wetlands by Charlotte Roche, which right. is a very explicit book about all bodily functions. And um, I mean, obviously, in the, the books sell in Germany and Austria, and they, they do cause some controversy, but they, it's not unheard of for people to write about um, right. sex and it's not as other as maybe Ellie were describing that it is here and there's certainly no bad sex award. Um, so um, I wanted to pick up on something that you said earlier about um, romance fiction and women readers um, and it's just a general question to all of you about who gets to write about sex and if we think that is going to change um, now after Me Too, if you want to feel optimistic and say we're gonna, are we gonna get, see a change? Well, not, not, in, not in a contemporary sense, but just thinking about, um, you know, we're talking about A Nice Nin and thinking about Henry Miller, and I was reading a lot of Henry Miller at the same time as I was reading A Nice Nin, and the, the different ways that they write about sex, you know, they, they were a couple, famously, um, or not, I mean, they were lovers, um, and you know he her her way of writing was really a way of finding a female way to write her female experiences I think and his way of writing is very you know it's all like uh, shoving it in and like doing hard things and uh, um, being a big masculine man um, and I, I feel like that really, I mean, both of them to some extent have dated quite a lot, I think, but I feel like maybe people don't talk about Henry Miller now, or at least I don't hear people talking about Henry Miller now in the same way, in, with the same reverence that they talk about Nin. And, and I wonder if that, you know, if, if the reading, if our reading of women writing about sex is kind of coming into it into its own um, and yeah maybe that like in 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 you know in in our contemporary situation in which we find ourselves um, whether, whether that has some resonance I don't know I don't know what anybody else thinks about that I, th I think that there um, is perhaps a small movement happening in what is 
annoyingly termed creative non-fiction. Um, so quite a lot of basically autobiographical work is being produced by women now, I think, um, but it's not necessarily being marketed as fiction. Um, but something like the Argonauts, for instance, that's a really good example of exploring what it's like to be in a female body and exploring um, uh, just what it's like to exist uh, within the gendered framework of that. And I just think that you're, you're right that no one talks about Henry Miller because why would you? There are a thousand other men talking about shoving things in places. <laughs> um, but there was something very specific about the way that Anise Nin um, reveled in things that are disgusting and sensual at the same time. And that's a really... that I mean, she was paid for that. She was paid... She, men paid her to write it so they could get off on it. Um, but it's actually become, in a way, her most important work, which I think is interesting. Um, because now there's a way of looking at it and saying, well, actually, it was quite groundbreaking what she was doing, although she was just churning it out for money. Um, so I, I don't know whether we will see a, a huge change, but I have definitely noticed the pinpricks of um, talking about being a woman specifically and also you know, non-gender specific, just exploring what it's like to be in a body. And I, I find that quite exciting. And, and I think you can't discount the economics, um, the force of economics in it. Um, so the success of Fifty Shades of Grey, whatever you think of the book and however you classify it, it did, I think it gave, um, you know, it proved that the female readership was actually a force to be reckoned with in, term, in financial terms. And then it was made into a movie and it became this, this juggernaut. And I think that probably opened publishers and readers' minds to the possibility of writing that is just more female-centric. Whether it's sort of cliched fantasies or not, it is less about shoving things places. <laughs> um, I, I want, I, I, thinking about gender, this is not specifically about sex, but about how you write gender in different languages. And I just wanted to uh, mention this book, The Iliac Crest, which um, is a Mexican novel um, that was published by Feminist Press in the US last year and we're publishing it and other stories um, in June. And um, it's basically a, it's about a man who one night is visited by two women who basically take over his home and set themselves up there and basically take over his identity. Um, and there's a really interesting... Um, way that they play with his gender or his his experience of his own gender and his gender identity um, and I think in terms of translation in terms of language it's a really interesting challenge because Spanish so I'm not a Spanish speaker but I know a little bit about how Spanish grammar works and there's a lot of ways that in Spanish you can you know you can't get away from the gender of the of, of the subject and the object um, or well whatever you know when you use adjectives for instance they they decline because of gender but obviously when you translate that into English so Sarah Booker has done a really fantastic translation here but she's had to be quite creative with how she with how she creates that gender confusion in in this kind of Male character, like male character, who may or may not be a man, um, and I'm really, I I can't read the Spanish, and I can't see for myself what she did, but I'm really, really fascinated by the idea of of what language does to to gender roles. Um, that's all. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's a really important point because, in a sense, this panel is a follow-up to a panel I organised at International Translation Day about gender and sexuality in translation, um, where we discussed um, topics to, similar to what you just raised. And um, a lot of um, what we discussed right now is just um, like a man and a woman having sex, and that 
doesn't include a lot of other sexualities, doesn't include um, a lot of other genders, um, which I think, I hope we will see much more of in fiction and I hope will get published more as well. Well, there is, there is quite a bit of homosexual sex in um, incest and it opens um, with something that, uh, one problem I have with Christine Ongo and this book is the way she appropriates other people's words and works. So it opens with her rewriting of Hervé Guibert's um, The Friend Who Did Not Save My Life. And so she, where he is talking about the experience of living with AIDS, she takes his words and changes, you know, it opens with, you know, I was, I felt I was condemned to be homosexual for three months. And that is just a changing of um, you know, Guibert wrote he was condemned for three months because he had just realized he had AIDS and he knew he was going to die. Um, and, and I find that profoundly offensive. I mean, I realized she was doing it with nudges and winks and sort of acknowledging it, but not always. And so you have some readers, um, the review in The New Yorker, he says, oh, it, it opens, you know, I, for, you know, I was homosexual for three months. More precisely, for three months, I thought I was condemned to be homosexual. That's a rewriting of Hervé Guibert, but the reviewer said, oh, you know, she opens with this feeling of being condemned, but condemned by who? And this, you know, and without, there was no way to flag the Guibert um, text because she doesn't make it explicit. And so, but um, that's just another, uh, a segue into her descriptions of, of there's a lot of explicit passages of all kinds of sex. And in fact, um, incestuous, voluntary, involuntary, homosexual, straight, um, it's, it's a pretty fluid book. It's, we should also say that this book came out in 1999, so we would hope that Angor's um, own attitudes towards homosexuality have hopefully changed. In, okay, maybe not. I'm not sure they, and, and, but it's hard to say what her attitude is and what she's um, uh, using for leverage. I mean, she's, she's written some really profoundly um, disturbing racial comments as well. And she, would, she often says that she does things like that to push the readers and to test your own prejudices, but I, it's not always clear. You know, how much is opportunistic, how much is provocative, and how much is um, exploitative, frankly, in her books. A real challenge Intentionally. to translate. Um, I want to make one last point before I open um, up to questions. And that is that, of course, um, we're all very conscious that we've discussed this from a very Western perspective. Um, originally, we were hoping to have an Egyptian author that we at English Pen work with who um, was condemned to a prison sentence for writing sexually explicit lyrics. So um, we just want, I just wanted to raise that and um, bring that in right at the very end. <laughs> um, yeah. I've just, um, I've actually, I've just finished reading, um, oh sorry. I've just finished reading When I Hit You by Mina Kandasami, just thinking about like non, <coughs> non-European, non-Western writers. Um, and she does really amazing things with writing about female experiences of, um, of abuse and you know, forced, forced sexuality, but also her own, her own kind of sexual awakening and the various different sexual kind of transformations that she goes through as a young woman. Um, and it was really interesting reading that and trying to think about um, her writing in the context of contemporary India where you have lots of rape cases for instance or you know men men raping women often very violently often in groups and justice not never being uh, or they're not not being any justice that you know nobody nobody being kind of uh, brought to justice and actually the woman often being blamed and and I I don't I don't want to say that you know this is I don't want to generalize about Indian society you know I don't have that much experience of it I don't know I'm not I don't feel I don't feel able to talk about it but I 
but I just thought reading about it was absolutely fascinating and and this is one woman's experience or one woman's fictional fictional or fictionalized experience I actually don't know what the author's I don't know if you know the author's relationship to the events in the book I don't I've heard her talk about it once but it was ages ago and I, it was long before I read the book so I've forgotten but I just really enjoyed her writing for a start and I really enjoyed this kind of small insight to one woman's experience um, so that's a recommendation if anybody wants I've got another recommendation if you're interested in um, literature from India and that's Sankita Bandhyapati's Abandon mm -hmm. and also her short story collection Panti which is um, from a female feminist or she wouldn't call herself feminist but from a female perspective and it's absolutely brilliant and I also have a final recommendation maybe now is the time for all of us to recommend books um, that we think feature good sex writing and that is Patrick Ness's release which was out last year and which is really outstanding in writing sex scenes surprisingly so in a young, young adult novel because they're often not that explicit okay um, I think now is the time to open it up for questions. Questions, answers, tell us about your favorite books that feature sex writing. We have a roving mic, so please wait for it to come around. And we've got our first question here. Hi. Can you? Okay. My name's Polly Barton, and I'm a Japanese translator. Um, thank you very much for that panel. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about buttoned upness on the side of the publishers. Um, so I'm currently working on a Japanese book which has done very well in Japan and it's very multi layered about many things, but it opens with quite a graphic um, sex scene featuring cosplay. Um, and I'm currently at the stage of approaching publishers with this, and I've been quite surprised by. The, I don't know what the, the polite word is, I guess the snootiness that I've been met with, you know, this, this sense of like, we don't do books like this. Like the idea that because it contains an erotic scene, it must be erotic fiction and erotic fiction is something that we don't want to consider as a literary publisher. Um, and I just wanted to ask all of you about your experiences with that, um, dealing with the publisher's attitudes to sex and erotic fiction. Who wants to go first? Nikki? I mean, <laughs> and, other, and other stories, we're really not afraid of sex at all. Um, and like, so both uh, Brett Easton Ellis and The Other Dogs by Lena Wolf and her forthcoming novel, Quick Plug, uh, the, poly, the Polyglot Lovers, which is out in 2019. And being, is being translated by Saskia Vogel, who herself is a sex writer or has, is, has written a novel called I Am a Pornographer, which is coming out this year I think um, um, she writes amazingly about sex Lena, Lena does um, and there's a really um, like insane scene in the forthcoming novel which is just like all, totally all consuming and wonderful um, and you know one of our first uh, one of the first books we published uh, features some hot, really actually kind of because we publish a lot of Latin American literature and just like French, French society, a lot of Latin American society is much more upfront about sexuality and so that automatically comes out in the literature a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, I, that sounds really fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> cosplay in sex, like crazy. Tess, what are your experiences? I, the, the explicit books that I've done have come to me from the publisher, so I... I don't have anything to add. <laughs> I guess I'll find out when my, I try and sell my next book. <laughs> cool. Um. Hi, um, I'm Marta Juroz. I'm a Polish translator. Thank you very much for um, all your wisdom. And I'm, I can't believe I'm about to say it. But this is more of a comment than a question. <laughs> I apologize. Um, I, although maybe it is a question. I was wondering, you mentioned um, erotica and kind of romance fiction and so on and so forth. I was wondering if any of you had any um, experience of reading fan fiction. Because I think that, um, and that's a recommendation to people who are interested in writing about sex in general. Because I think there's just, of course there's so much out there and it's very, very, you know, the, the kind of percentage of 
very bad writing in fan fiction is kind of proportional to the amount of fan fiction that's out there, but there is some absolutely transcendent and really, really good sex writing out there on the internet for free. Email me, email me with some <laughs> I will. I'll email you links. But um, honestly, if, if, ever, if anyone's kind of into um, having a two-week session of reading about sex, I think fan fiction is a good thing to include because it's, it does include very, very varied perspectives and sometimes very transgressive and very innovative approaches to, um, to the body, to gender, to pretty much everything. Anything goes. Thanks for bringing that up, Matt. I couldn't agree more. Hey. Hello, um, I'm Vanessa. Uh, I'm a writer and I'm bilingual. Uh, and I just wanted to ask a general translation question. Uh, what sort of training did you have to go to to translate? Because I find that there are some concepts and words that don't translate across languages. And I just wanted to know how, what sort of training you go through to mitigate that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, do you ever, do you ever find the solutions to those, to those things that don't quite translate a across languages? I think you have to... I mean, in terms, of, in terms of training, I think most of my translation training came just through reading, reading and reading and reading, and then translating and translating and translating and realizing the many mistakes I made. And, and I'm still, you know, of course, I'm still like constantly learning and I still had a conversation with somebody the other day who'd read one of my translations and was like, oh, there was a mistake. And I was like, oh, yeah, there was. That's a really bad one. <laughs> um, oops. And I, yeah. Didn't even know, um, but you know, I think mm, that I mean there are MAs that you can do that are really helpful, and you have a structure and you have a framework in which people can help you to learn and recognise interest. You know, like the good or bad ways of working although I think everybody has completely different ways of working and sometimes your way of working might differ from book to book or text to text I'm sure I mean it does for me um, I don't know what, what's your experience Tess? I mean I've, I've been saved by copy editors and oh, yeah. general <laughs> editors more often than I'd like to admit um, but one of the most helpful things that I've found um, is uh, translation groups formal and informal so there's a there's a group that meets in New York uh, it's open to everyone and you bring a couple pages of whatever you're working on or whatever you're stuck with and people, I mean, it's not workshopping, it's more a conversation. And I, there's, I know there's some in various cities, um, but if you can't find one, start your own. You know, or maybe go to the translation association page and post it if there's a, put out a call. That I, that I find most helpful is getting the feedback. And it doesn't even matter if you're getting feedback from someone who has your language pair. I would, I would also recommend to join the Emerging Translators Network because that was where I learned so much about how the publishing industry works and how to become a translator. And I think if it weren't for the ETN, I probably wouldn't have become a translator, possibly. I mean, I was already... A, sort of a fledgling translator when I joined, but it definitely helped me to realize that it was something that I could do, you know, really do. Do we have any other questions? Don't be shy. From like D.H. Lawrence to the Fifty Shared of Grey references, do you think there's a feminist way about writing about sex? And have you ever had any translations that you felt uncomfortable writing about because they were potentially um, problematic in the, way that, in the way they wrote about it? I think, um, I think it was the question uh, about whether we'd, whether we'd had translations that we felt uncomfortable about because of the way that, the way that sex was depicted or... Yeah, kind of, and if you think there's a feminist way about writing about sex. Um, so what do you mean, sorry, <laughs> it's really difficult to hear. Um, do you mean like whether the, the feminist aspect of it made us uncomfortable or whether we were uncomfortable as feminists translating something? Okay, that one. <laughs> um. 
Um, Tess, do you want to talk about Lucas Berfus? Yeah, I mean, it was so I, I was, um, it, with both of these books, this book and the Swiss book that I mentioned before, there were, there were moments of, of acute discomfort. Um, in incest, it's, it was primarily around the way that Christine Ongo talks about her daughter. She conflates her daughter and her lover in um, various passages, and yes, it's fiction and all that, and, and um, still, and her daughter is in her 20s now, and she lives in Boston and is, is, seems by all <laughs> appearances to, to have survived her mother's um, uh, writing career quite, quite well, but I, um, I focused on the larger intent of the book, which was to convey this, the experience of the emotional trauma to the readers. And to the, for the Swiss book, I, I spoke about this Monday, so uh, uh, excuse me for anyone who's hearing this for the second time. Um, the, the editor who bought the book didn't read it, c can't read German, and so she was quite surprised by when the manuscript was delivered and wanted to cut certain passages which were quite racist and misogynist and um, explicit. Um, I mean, you know, explicit, what's explicit? Some of it was just not, some of it was distasteful. Um, the narrator talks about his lover's veal-colored gums. This was a turn-on. And, you know, is that sort of, you know, and the, the, the bromide-colored um, insides of her knees and the, 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 the pink palms shading into, so at what point does it become descriptive? Does it switch from descriptive to judgmental and it's all context, it's all tone, it's all a subjective understanding? In any case, the, the editor then decided that she wanted to cut a couple pages, ran it by the author, the author said no, but what was interesting about the exchange was the author said, well, why, why do you want to cut this? Is it, you know, are you worried about, you know, the, the prudishness of American readers, even though it was a British publisher, you know, having the books banned. And, and she said, no, frankly, I'm editing this translation as I would any book that I receive, and I don't think the writing is um, up to par in these passages. So it ended up most, there were one or two lines that were cut, but most of it um, was put through and not even cleaned up in translation. It was, it was what it was, and it is what it is. So it's... I find that it's, um, the discomfort is there and it's real, um, but sometimes that's, that's what the book is and it's a matter of um, getting over your own judgment, in my case, for these two books. But I've never really been, I mean, if I were asked to translate the anti-Semitic memoirs of, uh, notebooks of Celine, I would probably just say no. I mean, I don't, I don't really think I have anything to say. I don't really think I have anything to say to that directly. I don't have any experience of that. But um, we're just thinking one, one thing that, uh, that I was mentioning to Theodora before we began was that when, um, <laughs> when Brett Easton Ellis and the Other Dogs was published, um, it was reviewed in, um, in The Guardian by Sarah Perry, who's a quite a prominent British writer. Um, and she has a, she's a feminist, but she also has a very kind of, um, uh, very, very religious background. And she's not now herself religious, I don't think, but she comes from this very, you know, kind of uh, conservative mindset. Um, and there are some passages in the book about prostitution, and there's particularly one character who is very young and has no money and she and her friend decide that they're going to be prostitutes and she you know it, it's quite a flippant it's written about in quite a flippant way you know they just do it and then and then she she has her first client as it were and meets him in a hotel but she actually finds that she can't go through with it and they end up just like having a chat um, but it was interesting because Sarah Perry talked about the she, she kind of mentioned, you know, she sort of criticised, basically, the, the sort of flippancy with which, um, with which Lena Wolf had, had approached the, the prostitution. And it was something that I found really interesting because hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me at all. I mean, I, I, I think that sex work is something that is, that obviously, like, 
is very complex and uh, has endangered women in a lot of ways and can be problematic but I think it's also something that can be a like really fantastic experience for people and I don't think it needs to be a, a heavy subject that we have to treat with you know with deep seriousness at all times um, so yeah so but I think there are probably other other you know there are probably feminists who would who would have a problem with that and I don't know I mean, you know, there are there are feminists who are pro or anti-sex work, and uh, I guess well, I don't know about Sarah's own political leanings, but you know, her her reading of it interested me. Um, Ellie, can I ask you about writing about sex from a feminist perspective? Um, yeah, so I think it's quite it's quite interesting as a writer to um, to carry your politics around with you. Um, and and write um, knowing that you'll you'll be judged um, your politics will be judged um, your feminist credentials will be judged and um, it's it's impossible to ignore and I don't think you should ignore it I do I do think that I do feel like I have um, I have a responsibility to write as a feminist but I also do you sometimes find it quite crippling um, and it's it's possible to second guess yourself while you're writing and that um, it, it definitely makes the uh, process of writing very difficult sometimes um, and I don't necessarily um, I, I think I think it's a privilege for, for men perhaps to not have to think about that to not one tends to think that you have to represent yourself through your fiction um, you have to represent yourself as a feminist as a woman um, whatever um, ethnic or cultural background you come from you feel like um, well, I've been given a voice and therefore I should use it responsibly um, and so yeah it's it's one of those things that I think you should do, but I do sometimes resent it a little bit, um, I have to admit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Do we have any last questions? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to be very British and say oh, I really find reading sex scenes impossibly difficult. Um, it's, it's, you know, various colleagues of mine have written sex scenes in their novels and it's, it's you know, I, I fluctuate between, oh God, mum and dad are kissing, to, um, oh dear, they do that. And I think, I, think that's, um, I think that is a problem with writing about sex, or indeed filming sex. Um, I, I, you know, I can only think of possibly two sex scenes in films that really work, and one is Don't Look Now, which was a long time ago. And one was rather a good Hungarian film called Another Way, which was a gay um, uh, love story. Um, you know, I, I do wonder if that's a particularly British perspective, that we really, really, you know, are kind of horrified by getting so up close and intimate with things. And I also, um, I, th I think with Catherine Mier that you mentioned, Tess, I mean, Catherine Mier, what, I had to interview Catherine Mier, and she said, oh, look, I'm like Madame Tout Le Monde, I'm, I'm Mrs. Anybody. Um, and that it was true because I think what made her book interesting wasn't actually the sex. The sex was, was kind of not really gone into what she liked, what she liked being done to her, what she did to other people. It was in the fact that she was so desperate to have some kind of contact, but no matter how many people she slept with, she was incredibly lonely. And that it was the loneliness through the sex that made the book an interesting book um, and made her such a sad character at the end of the book, maybe not in life, but well, a bit in life too, but I mean, certainly at the end of the book. So I'm, I'm saying, less sex, please, we're British. <laughs> Even though I had a cousin that starred in the other version of that. Well, as an Austrian, I can say we always need more sex in literature, which is why I programmed this panel. <laughs> um, and those are my closing words. Thank you all very, very much for coming. It was lovely to see you. Thank you to my panelists. Please, um, a round of applause for Ellie Goldstone, Tess Lewis and Sneaky Smalley. Thank you.